I'm pleased to have Saul Williams laughing with me right here What's in Studio up? Q. How are you? <laughs> I'm excellent. You're excellent. Yeah. Uh, it has been a difficult week for anyone with any connection uh, yeah. with Paris. Yeah. What's been going through your mind? I mean, I have two stepdaughters in, in Paris. Uh, one of my business partners is in Paris. Was, was I mean, my stepdaughter actually worked at the Petite Cambodge, um, the restaurant that was attacked, and she had quit like maybe a week before. Um, and uh, wow. and and my my business partner um, was was at the Eagles of Death Metal concert. I knew she would be there as soon as I heard it was the Eagles of Death Metal concert because I'd been to three of those concerts with her in Paris already. And so uh, and 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 you know she she's only been able to say, "Oh my God, what did I see?" You know what I'm saying? Wow. And it's just, uh, it's crazy to, to to think of, you know, like when you think of 9-11 and you, you can think of like, okay, that's a symbolic building. Um, you get it on one hand. And when you think of these way the Paris attacks were coordinated, they really, you know, struck these local places where Parisians hang. Like it, it was really a, a locally orchestrated attack that's just yeah. surreal to think of, you know, the the levels and heights that people will, will go to in order to make their statements. What what's the range of emotion you must be feeling a range of emotions. Yeah. Certainly. I mean, uh, it, it goes from exasperation um, to to this thing that makes you want to go, you know what, just stop religion, stop, stop, stop all this name brand religion association. Um, you, you question what it is. It makes you feel like maybe artists are not doing enough. If young kids are more, you know, eager to sign up with some extreme group than, you know, sign up to, uh, you know, Make music, make yeah. art, go to a concert, get into these things. That's part of what Martin Luther King is about, you know, is, is trying to like, you know, I think that sort of angst that comes with that, you know, adolescence or, you know, most of these guys are between 27 and 30, the ones that were killed. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, not the ones that were killed, but the uh, that were killed in the raids I'm talking about, the people that orchestrated these attacks. Um you know, and you think of that age, like the Twenty Seven Club, yeah. and all those people. You wow. know, there, yeah, you know, there's something that comes with that age, and you know, there's something that comes with adolescence. And Martin Luther King, for me, is about, you know, okay, if you have that angst of adolescence, let's point those middle fingers in the right direction. Let's point it at, you know, the stuff that we can destroy creatively mm -hmm. through art, um, through speaking up, through protest, and and through nonviolence means of 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 of, of approaching and, and 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 provoking change. It's hard not to think about that isn't it as an artist like you see this stuff go down and you're like what is my role what's yeah. my responsibility how can I like as you put it harness this restlessness that's yeah. out there yeah and this angst that's out there well I mean for me I think you know I think of poetry as like of course it's this ancient act you know, this ancient art form, but simultaneously, I think what we're writing and what we've been dealing with is are these algorithms, these algorithms that now these new engineers are starting to read and pay attention to. But that's what we've been dealing with is a certain type of, of algorithm. And so I think we're trying to find a way to like, you know, like I have this poem, Colton is Cotton, where I'm saying, hack into dietary sustenance, tradition versus health, hack into comfort, compliance, hack into the rebellious gene, hack into doctrine, capitalism in relation to free labor and slavery, hack into the history of the bank, is beating the odds of mere act of joining the winning team, hack into desperation, loneliness. We're trying to find ways to disrupt the norm, mm -hmm. you know, in the mm -hmm. same way that the hackers and, and all of, you know, the startup people are trying to do. That's what we've been trying to do for, that's what Rambo was trying to do, to disrupt the norm, to disrupt the thing that makes people fall into, you know, whatever it is they're born into and question authority, but in ways that are, that are not violent. That's an interesting parallel with engineering, you know, because poetry is about design. You yes, know, streamlining, exactly. perfect, exactly, uh, exactly. Pristine, and that's yeah. exactly what it is. That's why I've always felt like a modernist. That's why I've always felt like, oh no, no, I'm on the pulse of what's going on right now because it's it's exactly what you said. Poetry is the ultimate form of design of of, of streamlining an idea, an expression, an emotion, and mm -hmm. getting it understood on a level that that speaks on many. I want to ask you more about your connection to Paris. What made you initially pack your bags and say, "I'm going to Paris"? Um, I, I was living in LA and I was kind of just fed up with, with 
all that I was encountering and not encountering. I, I just felt like I needed a change of pace in my life. And I also felt like, wow, if I, I've always said that it would be cool to do that, but I'm not comfortable just sitting back and dreaming about stuff. I like to take action. And so I just, I had a window of opportunity where I was leaving, you know, my lease was up in a place and I was looking for a place. Um, and I encountered a friend from Paris who was like, you should take my place. I was like, well, what's the cost? And it was the same price as what I was looking for in LA. So I just said, ah, now must be that time. An amazing history of black American artists. Very true. Uh, in Paris, Nina James Simone, Baldwin. Richard Nina, Wright. Miles uh, Wright, Davis. Miles Davis, right. How did it feel, that relationship with that history? Did you feel a bit of a connection to that when you were in Paris? It's impossible to not feel that connection, although it's not something that you necessarily harp on, um, but it's impossible to not feel that connection. What I felt there was like a student. I felt like I was there to learn new references, to learn francophone references, to, to be exposed to cinema, uh, literature and art that, you know, whatever I was exposed to in the American aesthetic, I think there are cultural, uh, you know, aesthetics when it comes to, to, to taste and, mm -hmm. and what have you. And so America may be going crazy about, you know, one artist or one song on an album where you go to another country and they're like, oh, I like the B side of that. You know, that's the stuff that we pump here. And so it was, it was kind of like shifting my references and getting me into stuff that I wasn't exposed to. I just felt like a student there. I just and just like allowing those tastes to be yeah. absorbed and exactly. enter the fabric of who you learning are as a person. Learning new names, learning artist. who Boris Vian was, learning mm -hmm. who Marguerite Duras was, learning, you know, just learning new about new people. What about in terms of critique? Because you've critiqued America from within America, mm -hmm. then you're outside of America looking uh, yeah. Looking back, looking uh, looking in from the outside. What was that experience like? Well, that experience is awesome just because, you know, uh, there's there's something about stepping outside of the box. I mean, I, I see Canadians even have a very clear perception of America, you know, of, of, of United States of America, Americans, mm -hmm. um, just because they're outside of it. We, we, we may share many aspects of a very similar culture, but the fact that you guys stand on the outside and look in, it can give you a sort of like overview, which allows a Drake or a Bieber or a Feist or a, you know, I am a Conan or, or, or Alicia, or any of these people to be like, oh, I get it. I get what you guys are doing, but I'm going to, I'm going to hit it from this angle because I see that's what you guys aren't doing. You Interesting. Know? Yeah. I also wanted to know your perspective on Canada coming yeah. from, from America or, or looking from Paris and, and our society, even our racial dynamics yeah. here. Well, I mean, I, I I have to applaud like the new cabinet and 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 at least the surface forms of progression that we see. Um, of course, when I think of Canada and diversity and all this stuff, the first thing I think of is First Nation. And I think of the government's relation to First Nation peoples. You know, um, I, that, that to me, uh, and of course, I think of that as the same. I think of it in the same way in the states. Although I see it as as like, oh my God, you know, like Canadians may be like, oh, we have to wait for the states to do it before they they do it here, like legalizing weed or something. But I'm hoping that we're looking at the way, you know, that the dialogue that goes on between First Nations and the government here, and that that might affect something that happens in the states, because I think that's crucial when we talk about. About, you know Turtle Island and, mm -hmm. and 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 the real like story of America especially we're still on the topic of migration and immigration when we talk about this stuff you know what I'm saying it's and, all interrelated yeah it's all interrelated I want to ask you about a very interesting quote you've said that any black American wanting a taste of white privilege just needs a passport yeah what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that as soon I found at a young age, I mean, like I was an exchange student to Brazil when I was 16. I lived in Brazil for a year and anywhere, I, you know, which was funny in Brazil because of the racial dynamics and class dynamics there. And so, like, I would walk into a store, for, for example, in Brazil and people would automatically go, shoo, shoo, which meant, what are you doing in here? Get out. And I'd go excuse me? And they'd hear my accent and go, oh, wait, 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 I thought you were a black Brazilian. This is what they're thinking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, wait, where are you from? Oh, oh, would you like, oh, come, you do want to come home with me? You should meet my friends. You, we should go to a club. Da, da, da. And it's, and, and globally, I've had sort of that response where it's like, you know, it's, you, you go someplace and they think you're one thing, but then they learn that you're American and they're like, oh my God, Michael Jackson, Michael Jordan, oh my God, oh my, you know, and they're running through these list of characters that they've heard of but never had the opportunity to encounter because, of course, only 14% of Americans have passports, you know, so we're not really a traveling country. It's enough for many Americans to just travel within or around the country. 
you know, mm-hmm. th- than to make it out. And so when you do make it out, you find that there is a certain perception that follows America, not only, you know, like dumb and loud, but also this sense of like, Holy crap, yo! You're 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 from that hood that I see on YouTube, like uh, because America exports <laughs> culture yeah, to the whole exactly. world. Naturally, that creates some complicated dynamics for you in terms of encountering other racialized communities in these places. Mm-hmm. What's that been like? Uh, overall, it's been beautiful because I'm, everywhere I go, you know, I'm I'm really just a student, you know. So when I'm, you know, like in uh, Australia, for example. And a, a black Australian, which we call Aboriginal, but when we're there, they call themselves black, right? Interesting. We call them Aboriginal. They call themselves black. And so I'm there, and they're telling me, like, yeah, man, you know, they're not treating black people here, da 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 and then thank you, and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, holy You crap. really get a sense that yeah. race is a social construct at exactly. that point. Exactly. You yeah. totally get that because they, they call themselves black, except they don't count their lineage as being from Africa. They have their history that tells them they've been on that island of Australia for 60,000 years. These conversations around racism, uh, privilege, immigration we touched on, uh, they're a huge part of the public conversation now yeah. in North America. What do you think about what we're seeing now in that conversation? Uh, you know, I have to be honest. Part of the conversation is a little annoying and distressing to me just because I'm, I'm like, why are we still talking about this? Obviously, we are talking about it because we need to, you know, but I, I, I do wish at times that we could upgrade the dialogue and, and acknowledge things as constructs. You know, race isn't the only construct that we practice, the construct of, of, of gender, even the construct of poverty. Shoot, I could go into the construct of time. My birthday is February 29th. I'm 10 years old. I understand time as a construct as well as well you know (laughs) you know and so I think of the way that we practice these things and and how they shape themselves in dialogue and sometimes I feel like we 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 dumb ourselves down it's like even with new technology I remember looking at something like CNN in the states during the uh the what do you call it the 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 when people are running for office the yeah like the 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 election process right (laughs) and they use <laughs> and 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 I see in big letters like what they used to have only for the weathermen. It'll say the black vote, the white vote, and I'm like, really? We're using this modern technology to be able to print the word black that big, and you're talking about the black vote, the what? Like, there's something wrong about how we're approaching you know, these ideas. And it is wonderful to bring ideas of privilege, not ideas, but the realities into the discussion of privilege and supremacy and all of these things. But simultaneously, we have to be building that bridge that's going to help us transcend that sort of understanding and truly exist on a plane that allows us to acknowledge everyone as one. You're a father. How do you try to elevate that conversation for your kids? Um, through music and mm-hmm. art and literature that I expose them to. Quite simply, and mm-hmm. through the people that they encounter by hanging out and on their own, and and the way that I, you know, serve as like a mentor at times when they come home from school, like I had a fight with so and so because she said da 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 da, and it's and it's just or my teacher upset me because um, she said something that I thought was racist and blah 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 blah, and and basically teaching a form, you know, something. On one hand, it's like learning how to speak up. On another hand, it's learning how to empathize um, and, and, and just teaching them to be like bridge builders. Do you give them that complexity from the ground floor? I mean, there's an argument that can be made for with kids. You know, you have to simplify initially and then elevate it. Do you just go straight to, listen, empathy well, right no, away, kids nuance? Get it. Yeah. Kids get it at first. We complicate it for them. Kids get it. Kids get it at a really early age, and then they learn that they're black. They learn that they're white. They learn that they're this or that or da 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 or that, you know, and they learn the socialized behavior that's supposed to belong to this thing. But up into a certain age, they're operating from a really pure, some might say spiritual space of openness where they're just like, I get it. I see it all. That must be amazing to observe. Yeah, it is amazing to observe. Because I can't remember a time when, you know, these constructs were not in my psyche. Right. 
Right, right, right. But there were times when those constructs were not there. And we operate from that place of purity until it's distorted by the stuff that, you know, the adults practice on a regular basis. And at some point, it becomes embedded in us, even in our relationship to age. I hear 40-year-old people saying stuff like, oh, you know, I'm kind of an old man. I'm like, really, dude? You bought into that? You bought that? You know, like these these are constructs that we buy into, mm -hmm. and before you know it, we're practicing them, and before you know it, they shape us, and they shape society, and they lead to these things that we have to try to, to like, disrupt and hack our way through so that we can really live in the times that we're in. You're listening to Q. I'm Shad, and you're hearing Saul Williams, poet, actor, rapper, you name it. Tap dancer, <laughs> Tap. painter, coffee drinker, drinker, uh, I wanna spliff ask... roller extraordinaire. Can I say that? You can. You can. <laughs> That's totally, uh, it's in the code. It's in this book right here. That's a laugh. Um, I want to ask you about this forthcoming album, the title. When I read it, you laughed. Martyr, Loser, King. I think it's brilliant. Um, <laughs> Why do you think it's brilliant? Because those words are so powerful in and of themselves. I mean, there's, there's the wordplay there. But yeah. those words are so powerful. Boom. And in connection. Yeah. It's a title. It's a title. So I can say that Martin Luther King is one of many martyr loser kings. You know? Martyr in many senses. There are people, you know, like you don't have to be dead to be a martyr. Like uh, uh, some might say that a Mother Teresa was a martyr while she was living or, or Gandhi was a martyr while he was living. People that, that were, gave their lives to the service of humanity. Mm -hmm. People that give their lives to the service. And you can give your life when you're still alive. And you can give yeah. your life while you're alive. You don't have to like put on a backpack or a vest or anything like that in order to give your life in service to humanity. In fact, I would say that that is a, a more honorable way of doing it, it's trying to do it through life rather than provoking death. So right? is this the arc then? Mar you're a martyr, you're a loser, and then you're a king? The loser, the loser is from the construct of the idea of the the the, the disenfranchised, the, the the misbegotten, the forgotten about, the voiceless, you know, and you know, like for those of us who don't live like rappers in their videos, you know, the for those of us who don't have, you know, the 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 need to like call someone in our own house who lives on the opposite, you know, <laughs> you, you know, like for those of us who are not Drake, yeah. you know, and who who don't have that nice car or 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 can't afford this, you know, we fall into the so-called loser category. Of course, I don't believe that we're actual losers. You know, it's just to say that the losers are the winners, the people that that actually don't share the values of what winning is according to the mainstream. Mm. Right? And then the king is just the, the last name because, of course, we're not trying to deal with any hierarchical, mon monarchical, patriarchal sort of system there. You know, it could just as easily be Marta Loser Queen. Um, you know, that, that there you go. That, that That's Chelsea Manning. That's, you know, like that. we're on and on and on with it. It's it's just the the last name that the, you know, it's just there, the surname. When I, when, the I see it, when I see a, a title like that, it's like uh, poetically perfect. You know, we talked about design earlier. Mm -hmm. Right. It's concise. It's concise. You, get, you, you can, there's a lot. It's like a thumb drive, you know? It's, to, it's like a thumb drive. There's a million ideas that can come from this brief, you know, association of words. Like, uh -huh, yeah, all right, yeah. nice one. Nice one. But I've played with that for ages with like Niggy Tardust. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've always played with, you know, these slight little like in many ways, I'm like a graffiti writer, like writing tags over existing things, you know. Can you describe uh, the, the process or the sensation when you're getting at these precise, concise poetics? Well, you know, when you like. Popped a lot of Molly and no, um, you know, the, the sensation, is, <laughs> I'm just trying to upset the Canadian broadcast. No, um, <laughs> Molly is also in the guy. Yeah. I met Molly Ringwald. You know, when you've watched The Breakfast Club a million times in a row and you're just like, I love this movie. And you're like, you get that high, <laughs> yeah. you know, and you get, no, the sensation is like when you're like sitting in a chair and you lean back and you feel like you're about to fall and you catch yourself just at the last minute right before you fall it feels like that no that's a Stephen Wright joke it's um <laughs> it's the sense of of what is the sensation I don't know I don't know. It's it's one of just like having, I try not to rest too much in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I try not to celebrate that. Like, okay, I get it. I'm moving on now. You know what I'm saying? So I can't really tell you. It, it just feels like a, a something to check off. 
Like interesting to do on the to do list. Got it right. No, we move Anton on. Anton Chekhov. <laughs> it feels like I've completed an Anton Chekhov play. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, one last quick question for you. We've talked about the artist's role uh, in these times. What do you What do you see it as? Hacking the masculinity, femininity, sexuality, what is taught, what is felt, what is learned, what is shared, hacking the God's stories of creation. I'm, 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 I'm sampling myself. Mm-hmm. I believe that the, the artist's role is real simple. Just be alive and present to the moment and try to find a way to not perpetuate the corporation's desires, but the people's desires. You know, a few minutes ago I heard, you know, get up, stand up. It took Bob Marley nine albums to blow up. You know what I'm saying? But we're still referencing the Bob Marleys, the Neil Youngs, the Nina Simones, the Bob Dylans, the Hendrixes, and all of these artists that realized something that was a bit more powerful than how to walk out of an executive meeting at their label. You know? Saul Williams, uh, thank you so much. Thank you.